Hey there, YouTube. Welcome on back to Artichoke Dip. My name is Rob, Solo Tabletop Gamer. And in this video, I'm going to talk about a gaming system that I picked up in the spring. This is when the whole entire COVID thing began, and I thought, well, maybe I should find something new to keep me busy for a while for what we thought was going to be two weeks at the time. It turned out to be longer than that. That game is Forbidden Lands. So before I get into this, if you liked the video, please click the like button. And if you haven't subscribed, click that subscribe button followed by the bell icon. Every time I upload a new video, you'll get a notification so you don't miss one. So I've watched a lot of reviews. Different people play this. People talked about it. I had picked the game up. And then, for whatever reason, every time I went to it, just as you've seen in the beginning, that was my overall feeling about it, and I didn't know why. Cracked pages, thumbed through it real fast, closed it up, and put it back away. Maybe it had to do with I was associating it with this uh, whole entire pandemic and everything it brought with it, or... <laughs> Maybe, just maybe, the way I am with games at times, I'll pick them up and I won't get into them right away. I'll put them on the shelf. They'll sit for a little while and um, I'm interested in different games, different things at that time that really, how should we put this, um, occupy the time I do get to really enjoy gaming and it just takes me a while to get to them. Maybe that's it as well. But for a while, I just couldn't bring myself to it. Didn't know why. And then it was Thursday night. Sat down and I cracked open the Forbidden Lands Player's Handbook. And I started to read it. It's good. It's really good. I was really, really surprised how this system, how, oh, first of all, let's just get into what I really like about this system overall. The fact that this, I think out of all the RPG games I have played so far, and now, don't get me wrong, all RPG games are story oriented. That's what an RPG game is. It's about telling a story and you being the director and or narrator and using the dice to well alter the way that the storyline is gonna go one way or another. But this system takes it in my opinion a step further in the fact that it gives you such rich detail to work with for a good example, the villages. Most RPG systems you play in, they're going to give you a village unless you buy a specific um, module or campaign setting that has everything mapped out for you and all the details and the NPCs and everything else that goes with it. It's mainly left up to you and I think a lot of people um, probably do it the same way. You know, instead of investing all that time into one village, it's just pretty much a cookie cutout, and you put in there what you need as you need it, which is a good way to do it. But in this system, it goes a step further, a huge step further, and with a few dice rolls, you can get an extremely elaborate village and a background with a rich history, and it's awesome, which I have to say, I'm pleasantly surprised. Now the system works on a D6 system and of course I've um, they did offer dice sets for a while which everybody seems to be sold out of but when I looked at the set I just kind of was like eh, I mean I got enough dice do I really need a six-sider to give me two blades? No not really. A six-sider is a six-sider and it's if you played any type of RPG game that utilizes a silhouette system or a D6 system, you understand that a 1 is a fail and a 6 is an automatic success. 
So it was kind of for me like, okay, let's look at a picture of this dice set they're talking about out of this and see what it has to offer. And I seen it and I'm like, well, I have all those. I really don't need that. But the thing I didn't have was the generator set it has in here. All the way from my beginning story that started here that just right off the get-go. At first, when you look through the player's handbook, it looks like a lot to take in, and there is a lot. I mean, you could spend an entire day reading everything in this book, but once you skim over it and you familiarize yourself with it, it's actually a very um, simple system to grasp very quickly. Characters are very easy to make. An NPC would only take you a very minimal amount of time as a game master. But the best part about this whole system is it works great solo. Really good solo. As a matter of fact, as long as you have the set with the game master's manual to give you all your encounters and everything you need to know to run the encounters and NPCs and your backstories and this, you have everything you need besides the map. Even the map is very cool for the fact that how they designed it, unlike a lot of RPG systems that we've seen, were to give you a book outlining the areas and here's a map. And for most part, the map is just kind of like fluff. It's It looks nice, it's cool. It's really not practical in any sense, other than you can you lay it out on the table and the other players can look at it and go, ooh, ah, great, and then at that point, you pretty much get rid of it. Or you hang it on your wall, something like that. But besides that, it really doesn't do a whole lot. Whereas in this system, the map is everything. The map, is your entire history through your story through the game and not only that as you move into different hexes how you move is unique compared to a lot of other RPG games to where I have been so used to dealing with RPG games that are designed with the mindset of miniatures in them and movement that this is completely different, whereas if it breaks up your movement into four quarters of the day, your morning, your midday, your afternoon, and then your evening, and while this is all going on and you are exploring this world that you create off of a few D6 rolls, on top of that, you have to be very mindful of food and water for your characters, because if not, they can succumb to thirst and or hunger quite quickly. Not only that, it's very unique how they even include the mind thought of what if it's winter time? How can they endure? Well, is the coldness going to get to them? Are they going to freeze to death or fall? That's all outlined in everything. The amount of attention and detail that was put into this game is just absolutely amazing. And I'm kind of sitting back now. I have spent the whole, almost a whole morning sitting here and I uh, worked on some characters over yesterday and it, uh, got those done while I sat and streamed some Netflix and then I decided this morning, you know what? Let's try this. Let's roll it out. Let's see how everything works. And to my surprise, hours have flown by and it's a great system. I think the most unique thing I like about it is how it's built on, instead of the old style hack and slash where you just go in and slash your enemy down, this um, kind of puts a different spin on things. Even how the encounters at that point relate back and they even say you should save combat to the last absolute positive resolution to the situation because the fact is 
combat in this system is extremely lethal and there's a lot hanging in the balance as a matter of fact you only have a very limited amount of life to deal with with your character and you have to be very careful on the decisions you make otherwise it's going to be a very quick game now with that being said i don't want to scare you off because that's not the intent i want to talk about how great this is how i mean i'm blown away at how great of a system this is i i have heard other game channels talk about it and rate it quest wise he it's an excellent system loved it i have to agree with him the books the binding and everything are absolutely just gorgeous when you look at them i mean leather bound book the nice thing i like about it now of course you can see i got my sticky notes marking areas that i need i recently ordered the game master screen when i say recently i mean yesterday um that way i don't have to worry about burning the books out flipping back and forth i'll have all my tables and everything i need right there in front of me so at that time if i need any well information i can just go back to the book and save the spine of the book but the cool thing is i love are the page markers that they give you in these things it's just high quality books the artwork is excellent in them even though it's a black and white artwork it's just absolutely very very awesome rpg game i have to say and I'm amazed. I'm just, um, I'm dumbfounded at this point that I haven't had a peaked interest in it until recently. And I'm glad I did because, man, I'm telling you, if you guys haven't tried this yet, you should. Particularly if you enjoy solo RPG gaming. I mean, Everything I do on my channel, I try to focus around solo. Something you can sit down at the table and you don't have to have a game master or a whole lot of people to play it. You can just sit down and enjoy whatever it is you like to do, sci-fi, fantasy, so on and so forth, and give you those ideas how to run them games by yourself and enjoy a session by yourself. And in this system, you can do that quite easily as a matter of fact even though you have the game master's guide and it says in there oh you shouldn't let the the uh players read this and destroy all the fun really the way this is set up man you never know what you are going to get and well, let me get to my encounter section here So anytime you enter, and I'm gonna get, we're gonna go to the table here in a minute, and I'm gonna show you the map a little bit more and what I'm talking about and some of the things I found that I use that might help you guys out there um, if you pick the system up or maybe you're struggling with it. But the thing that's absolutely amazing that I like about this system. So typically, anytime you play an RPG solo, the one thing that seems to be the most tedious about it is building your encounters whether you make your own table and you write down the counters whether your encounters are pre-planned and you've already built a dungeon or you have a scenario you've already built and you know it's already in there or have a general idea this goes a step further this gives you a cool table that you roll off of you look at the terrain that your characters are currently in, whether you're in plains, forests, dark forests, hills, mountains, a lake, marshlands, quagmire, and or ruins. At that point, cross-reference the number, and it's gonna give you a number on here. That number corresponds with an encounter as you read through it some of these are very very I haven't been through all of them been through a couple of them some of the uh, things I can say I ran into the blood mist and the blood mist were uh, oh man 
it. It's um, it can be very formidable if you allow it to. Luckily, my characters were already in the forest, so they were able to climb up some trees and escape it. But if you stay too long at that point, it can attract a blood demon. And then once that happens, things get ugly real fast. Considering when your characters start out, you don't have the best armor or weapons. And these things are just lethal. The other cool thing was, was one of the encounters I ran across was the ogre. And how they give you a description of what your characters see, which is cool because it adds into your storyline. But also with it, um, everything in this game, when it comes to the characters, is just skill heavy. You're rolling against skills. Even combat is a skill. So everything you meet is a role in an opposed role. Now, with the ogre, how it went, which was kind of funny, my characters were lost, they were trapped all evening up in the trees from these blood mists and they couldn't go down. If they did, it would mean certain death. But as the morning came, and this is in the middle of winter in my game system, mind you, not because it's winter here, because when I rolled the dice, that's what I just, I was like, okay, this, this, and this will be this time of year. Turned out to be winter. So they started out with a clear intention as to where they were going to go. They quickly got lost in a blinding snowstorm, only to find themselves, um, oh, I don't want to get too far ahead. But anyways, they spent the evening up in these trees that came down there was this ogre my sorcerer was able to reason with this thing to a certain extent because they're not that smart but using some manipulation was able to strike a deal with it and say look we don't want to fight you but uh, we need to find uh, some civilization we need to find something we need to get some sleep some food and we need to heal is there anything we can trade or bargain with to help with that? Well, the ogre happened to have a uh, captive in the sack he was dragging behind him, a human captive. And how my story went is he said, okay, I'm looking for some entertainment. He said I was going to take him back to the lair and, I don't know, maybe we would uh, quarter him with some horses and sit and watch, but he said, what the hell? This is entertainment's entertainment. He said, either you or your warrior back there are going to spar with him to the death. And if not, I'll kill both of you. They agreed. So my character, uh, well, he was able to pull it off, was able to kill him, gained a weapon and a little bit of silver out of it. But in the end, they found a village. And that's where my story left off, but let's talk about this a little bit more into depth, how the game works, and show you a little bit of mechanics behind it so you can see what I'm talking about and heck, maybe this game will find its way onto your game table. I can only hope because this is a really, really cool game. Let's move on to the table. So I still have my game board set up here. As you can see, I got my snow or arctic grid terrain and, you know, my little pine trees from Hero Quest from years ago, but they still work great. But let's move this stuff out of the way and let's talk about Forbidden Lands a little bit here and get into what Forbidden Lands really is. So, Forbidden Lands, when you open up the box set, you're going to get a cool looking map. And you're going to realize real quickly that it's two sided, it's the same image, both sides, on the map. And of course, in that box, you're also going to get. 
some stickers. Get them off here. Like so. That's intended to mark areas on the map as they're discovered. The only problem is, is these, as you can see, are of crappy, crappy quality stickers, as a matter of fact. Um, you know, I deal with decals and stuff like that on equipment on a regular basis, and I spend a lot of time peeling decals, so when I can tell you these are low quality crappy stickers and or decals, however you want to refer to them, um, yeah, I, got, I can tell you right now, I know it when I see it, and man, these are crappy. So I decided we're not going to use these. And on top of that, what if I want to play a different adventure or start over or have multiple stories at one time with different characters? Isn't that going to ruin everything? Having the sticker <laughs> plotted right there on the map. Most people could say, well, you could turn the map over and use the other side. Well, yeah, sure. But what do you do when you do the same with that side? Then at that point, I guess you could order more maps if you wanted to. Me, what I did is decided, you know what? Why don't I make things easier for myself? Now, if you're like me, you read a lot. And, well, I do a lot of RPGs. Constantly reading, taking notes, putting stuff down. So these things, you know, are magical. The sticky note use them a lot but what I decided to do to track my progress through my game was to put one here to show where my character started and my story started for this and as I move into a new hex track it now my story is supposed to take my characters to a place down in here in the mountainous areas and let's uh Let's get into that a little bit, how I came up with it, and, well, where it came from. Because that part, I think, may surprise you. So, one thing I can say about this game, if you enjoy um, writing stories, you enjoy... Um, that creative aspect of RPGs to where you can detail every single minute um, what am I the word I'm looking for every single minute detail about your world you're gonna find this game is gonna give you a huge amount of ammo to do that with whereas of other RPG games are more focused on combat so to speak and miniature skirmish moving around the board this one leans more towards fantasy of the theater of the mind if you will now of course that doesn't stop me from using my minis on my table of course I still use them in the mark off where things are going and all that it only heightens the experience when I have a 3D representation in front of me and I'm able to be able to project it from my imagination to the table where I can sit and I can look and move everything but let's get into the basics and talk about the basics of what this game is and see if it's right for you so the first thing obviously you're going to do is you're going to open up the player's handbook and you're going to go through it and like i said at first glimpse this can seem pretty intimidating don't let it be it's really really not as a matter of fact if you go straight to this section right here which tells you how to create your player character you can do it that way, which is a quick way. It walks you right through it. You know, your first character is going to take you the longest to make because, well, you're going to have to fumble through. You're going to have to find. You're going to have to read a little bit to understand. But if you've played RPG systems before, 
you'll pick it up pretty quick. Now, for a lot of us out there that have played the D20 system for most of our gaming lives, I will say, um, this might be a... It's not going to be too far of a stretch, but I think the thing that's going to throw you off a little bit is the fact that it is, in fact, this is a skill-driven game. Even, like I said, combat gets back to skills, not hack and slash, roll a 20-sider. If you hit the armor class, roll your damage and deduct hit points. It doesn't necessarily... it Damage works that way, but not exactly like a d20 system so when you start out to make your character at that point everything is how do I put this it's a very templated game and you go through you choose what they call your kin and your kin in fact is your race and you decide whether you want to be a human you want to be an elf you want to be a dwarf whatever half elf whatever or halfling, even they have a wolfkin, and you can even play a goblin. So, depending on whatever your interests are with fantasy gaming, and some people tend to like to lean towards elves, elves are more nimble, they get a higher dexterity, they have a higher amount of defense. Others, people like to gravitate more towards the more bulkier, if you will, of on the race scale, which is going to be more of like your half-orcs or your orcish, the more brutish, because those are going to be your tanks. Those guys are going to be able to withstand huge amount of damage and be able to deal a lot of damage as well on the battlefield. This, that comes into play, but... You really, really have to look at what you really want to play. And the fact that, I, what I mean by that, is the unique thing about this system and the way that it's written is that the humans, which are very adaptive, and we'll get into the talent here in a minute, are actually the new kids on the scene, if you will, in this game world. And... The world has been dominated and discovered and owned, if you will, for a lot longer by the elves and the dwarves of this world, which is unique. I really do like that little twist. Now, as you look at the kins, it's going to give you, it's going to suggest, hey, typical professions, such as a dwarf. If you decided to play a dwarf, your key attribute is going to be strength. In your typical profession is going to be a fighter, a minstrel, or a peddler. Now, a halfling, I guess you, you know, a lot of you would be thinking out there, well, you go back to J.R. Tolkien, you would think a burglar and or a rogue, which you're not that far off. They suggest typical professions would be a minstrel, a peddler, or a rogue. A peddler, which I have not chose to play, but is, would be a merchant, a rogue, will you if you played fantasy gaming, you know what a rogue is. It's a thief or uh, however. And a minstrel would be the same as if you played a D&D system. It's a bard. So there you go. They're using music in a magical sense to be able to um, alter their environment around them to their benefit or to their enemy's disadvantage. However, you'd like to look at that. Wolfkins, I haven't got into a whole lot. Goblins, like I said, I have just recently started playing this, so I really haven't um, delved that deep into this area. Um, I suggested, I went with two kin for mine. Mine was a human and a half elf, and I'll get into their characters here in a minute. And then moving on from there, you go from your kin to your profession. Your profession will be the same if you're playing a D20 system. It's going to be your class. You're going to pick what do you want to be. Do you want to be a druid? Do you want to be a fighter? Do you want to be a hunter? A hunter, I would compare this as the same as a ranger in D&D. &D. 
or D20 systems, a minstrel, which would be the same as a bard in the D20 system, a peddler, which is a merchant, which is kind of, um, it's unique. And that's a very cool thing to add into an RPG system, given the fact that the majority of time, merchants are just NPCs and really not a playable character class. But in this game system, it is, and we'll get into that here in a minute. You can go into being a rider. Um, as far as the rider goes, this is, feels very Tolkien-esque to me. I mean, this is just like, makes me think of the riders of Rohan from Middle-earth. The rogue, the sorcerer. Now, here's the cool thing about this. So you go through first and you pick your kin, what kind of kin you're gonna be, your race. Then you go through and pick your profession, or class it's at that point you get into your attributes you're gonna roll using two six siders and you're gonna pick one to be your tens the other one to be your single digit and it's gonna be a percentile system right very simple so I would have a 54 right there it would be at that point you would cross-reference your kin or your race, and you would look at that. So let's say I decided to play a dwarf and I had a 54. Well, a 41 through 80 would make him an adult. And the fact that he's an adult, I would then at that point go and look at my attribute points. So an adult's gonna get 14 points. Now, you may think, okay, 14 points, but when you start out, you get four attributes. Out of those 14 points, you have to, at that point, allot those to those four key attributes, which may not seem difficult at first, but, well, there's various things to consider because everything going back to your very first decision of the kin you want to play, I went too far, gives you a key attribute as to how to play that particular kin. And then when you get into your character class as well, it's also going to um, suggest a key attribute as well, which is gonna reflect there. So looking at that, 14 points would be that would be a lot of attributes to be able to put into that character and to I mean you could do a whole lot with that as you move on you get to pick your talents talents are what I would explain in the d20 system if you've been playing third edition forward it's gonna be the same as your feats it's the best way I can explain that to you talents are gonna give you an edge um, that your character particularly has above the rest of the inhabitants of this world, if you will. So as you go through the talents and you look at them and you learn more about talents, it's going to explain to you how they work. And Everybody starts out with their kin talent, one professional talent, and then a general talent. And you go through and you pick those out and it's at this point to we get into a thing called willpower and how the willpower works. So I think at this point you you know you understand the kin, the profession you pick your talents and from there on out I mean your character sheets pretty straightforward if you pick this at this point then at that point it's simple enough to look at your skills and your skills depending on the class that you picked is gonna tell you what your key skills actually Yeah, they're gonna give you, tell you for that, profes that profession, 
these are your key skills. So at that point, you would go through, you would take your number here from your attributes, which would transfer over to here. Now you're gonna get a bonus to these professional skills, if you will, class skills. And what that's going to reflect is how many dice you're going to roll for that particular skill. Now, given this example that they're showing us here in the book, as you can see, we have a half elf sorcerer and they have a lore skill of three. So I would roll my 3d6. Now, this would automatically be a failure marked by, which these are supposed to be ones, but they're skulls. Now, I would have a decision. I could either accept my fate that, hey, I failed that lore check and move on, or I could say, you know what? I'm gonna push and I'm gonna re-roll these. Now, of course, if I re-roll again, and I was to roll, let's say, two skulls again, at that point, I would take two points against that attribute. That attribute going back to lore would be my wits, and my wits would go from five down to a three. Now, out of that, because I pushed it, I would get willpower points. Willpower points are used to use your talents. And as you look at your talents, they give you bonuses to your skill roles. So as an example, I could have had a talent that said, hey, um, by using this, you could re-roll that roll, which means just as an example, I could use one of those points and then re-roll my roll at that point, haha, -ha, getting a success and ultimately at that point, passing that lore check. Now this is just all an example. This isn't the rule straight out of the book. I'm just trying to make it a simple, um, a simple little video here, if you will, just to make things move smoother. Pretty much that's your character in a nutshell. That's just how simple it really is. Moving on from there, you're gonna see everything you would normally see in an RPG you've played so far, encumbrance, carrying too many items, or <laughs> not enough. But the thing I really do enjoy about this game the most is your conditions. If your character does not rest overnight, right here you can see, you become sleepy. At that point, it has adverse react. Um, it has, <laughs> I better take a sip of this monster. So, with the conditions, let's say you are sleep, sleepless. Because you are sleepless, there is going to be, at that point, certain modifications that are going to be imposed on your character, and not good ones, because you have not slept, as well as thirsty. You can become thirsty. You have to track how much water your character is drinking throughout them four segments of what they consider a day, which it will be morning, morning, day, afternoon, and then evening. And then of course, you also have another condition, which is hungry, which you also have to eat rations. If your character does not eat rations, they suffer conditions and modifiers from that as well, and cold. So anytime it is not summer spring in this game system it is fall winter depending on how your adventure rolls you have to roll against your endurance if you fail your endurance roll it is at that point that you take a point of damage against your strength now at any time any of your abilities are reduced to zero you become broken broken well let's just go into broken and see what broken is So, when your attribute score reaches zero, you are broken. This means that you are put out of the action in one way or another. 
exactly what it means to be broken depending on what attribute has been depleted. Strength, you are knocked senseless and you roll for a critical injury of that type and damage you have suffered. Wits, you are paralyzed by fear or confusion and you roll for a critical injury on the whore table. Agility, you collapse from exhaustion and you can only crawl and wheeze. You can't perform any other actions. And then of course, empathy, you break down in despair or self-pity and you must either explode in a violent outburst, kicking and breaking everything around you or withdraw from everybody around you. So as you can see, you don't want to become broken. Broken is a bad thing in this game system. I think at that point, as far as character creation goes, I mean, I covered character creation in a nutshell. That's how simple it is. You pick your kin, you pick your profession. At that point, you roll on your age table, you take your attributes, you assign them, and you go through and you make a few other different uh, decisions on how you want to make your character. Those being, you start out with a pride and you pick that out when you make your character. My health elf sorcerer, because I decided when I started this out, two characters, one which would be a fighter and the other one which would be a magic user. That way I can learn the system at the same time using two characters, both the combat side of it and the magic side of it, how the system works. And so far, it's been very fun. So, the pride, you have read many books and know the way of the world. I have a dark secret, that is, you are haunted by visions of the world behind the veil. Which means, so she's a sorcerer, she's seen things that, things that other people um, don't notice, visions maybe, or other weird things that... Uh, plague her dreams, if you will, at night. The other thing is reputation, how well you're known, and your reputation at that point, I would write down there, and as that adds up, that's later on thing. And then, moving on from there, that's pretty much it in a nutshell, until you get to your back half of your character, which is your armor, your weapons, your, any equipment you carry, your riches such as your gold, spells, so on and so forth, and then you're pretty much done. At that point you move, everything else is a die roll, and out of that die roll you get some very interesting things to work with. You move on to this book right here, which is called Legends and Adventures. The first part gives you backstories. The second part gives you a legend generator, and then you have a monster generator. If you want to generate your own unique monsters for a particular encounter, you can do that with this. As you move through, and this is a quick way too you can use for NPCs. You could, as a matter of fact, skip everything in the beginning of the book and just use this and it's automatically going to generate your kin. And then as you get your kin, you go through there. And this would ultimately build a character for you, is what I'm trying to get at. Although, me personally, I, want, I wouldn't want to leave that all up to 100% die roll. I do want a decision on my character and how I build them and the way I want the story to move and all that. So, but... Let's move on from there and let's get into some backstories of characters and some of the just cool stuff that comes out of it. I mean, so using this, I came up with the backstories for my characters. My first character, which is Sankre which is a half-elf outcast from the edge of Darkwood and a student of Master Talon of the symbolic disciplines, but soon curious of the world, wanders the world to experience firsthand the experiences she has only found in books. Which gets back to the way I picked this with her pride. You have read many books and you know the way of the world. 
My second character, who's the human fighter, Balder. An elderlin from... Now, the elderlin is a species of human in this world from the plains of Moderna. Orphaned... He was the plains of Mol Moderna and orphaned. You know the perils of this world all too well. Captured at a young age, you spent many years in a dark dungeon until fate would have it and you were able to escape... So those are the backstories of where they came from. They're both kind of outcast, if you will, in their own right. And how they met. It went into how do your characters meet. And this is how they met. Sancre and Balder met while hired as rear guards for a caravan that crossed the lands after many hardships and losses. Once the caravan reached its end, they decided to start a new life as adventurers. So basically traveling with this caravan everything the hardships the losses and everything that they have seen they kind of decided rather than using their talents that they had to make for others why not just go into business themselves and basically ultimately make money for themselves now the last thing which we'll go into is the really cool one is the legend generator out of this I really enjoyed this part and this is what really makes the game particularly for a solo experience so rich and unique this is my legend that came out of this so in the apex of the elder wars the elder wars was a war between the humans and the dwarves and the elves and bad juju bad blood between them territory disputes the whole nine yards I'm not gonna really go into that that's part of the history of this system and depending on what timeline you're playing in because yes it does take that into account as well you'd read the history to give you an idea as to what's actually going on in the world that your characters are um, basically unveiling this story of their adventures in. so the legend is the apex of the Elder Wars a power-hungry vain priest by the name of Vaxus, who sought the den of an ancient green dragon known as Nilforten to gain knowledge of the secret location of the Scepter of Immortality, located in a hidden cave. Close by, according to the legend, in the mountains of the southeast, Voxus was not given immortality, but the power to heal any wound simply by grasping the scepter. Upon his death, the scepter was locked into a stone burial monument with Voxus' remains. Legend tells that the area is protected by not only Voxus' ghost, but his loyal followers that have perished there as well. That's the legend backstory. That's where my characters are headed to. That's how, with the map, they started out here, and they're heading to the southeast. So somewhere over in this area is where the story's taken me, and maybe they'll find what they're looking for there. But there's a lot more to it than that. So that is a very very cool resource to have I mean, this book alone with the legend generator and the backstories for any rpg system you're playing could bring just an immense amount of um richness and uh <laughs> a lot to your game a lot i mean for me i'm kind of like kicking myself right now because i wish i would have gotten into this a little bit earlier but you know what Hey, we've had a long weekend. It is the holiday weekend, so I guess this was the right time for me to sit down and be able to really get into this. Now, everything else is pretty much outlined in the system for you as far as the journeys go, tells you how to make your way through the world, and there are other things that are taken into account that all go back to rolling against your skills. Anytime you move into a new hex on the map at that point, 
somebody has to be the pathfinder, if you will, the leader, the one leading the way, saying, let's go this way, let's go that way. And they have to roll against a skill check. If they fail that skill check, at that point, you have to go to the mishaps. Now, this is where the real fun comes in. And this may look like a bad thing, mishaps, but it's not. It. This is how I ran into the blood mist. This is how I found an abandoned cabin to where the occupants there, well, when we got there, they were taken away, the door was kicked in, and um, we don't know who took them, but, you know, there was some um, supplies in there that my characters needed to help them survive this cold, bitter winter storm that they had just endured and to help them move along. And it also uh, led to many other mishaps. I mean, that's just the way it works. It's very cool how this adds a twist into your story and it challenges you even solo. If you're playing solo, this is going to challenge you. It's not gonna be, I'm gonna skate through this like a good old fashioned dungeon crawl, kick the door in, I'm gonna dominate the dungeon and kill everything in it. You're gonna find out in this game system real quick. Your characters are but a very small cog in a very, very large wheel. So moving on from there, if you, you can forage and you have to do a skill check. If you miss that, you have to go through foraging mishaps. You can hunt and of course, there are hunting mishaps. There are fishing mishaps. You have to make camp for your character as well. There are, well, you guessed it, camping mishaps, even resting mishaps. It goes into sea travel mishaps because, well, there are large bodies of water marked on the map and you can at that point traverse these areas by a maritime vessel. So the last but not least you get into the stronghold. Um, the stronghold and like I said today was my first game session and so I haven't acquired enough to really get into this part about it but what the stronghold is it's about collecting riches and reputation and building for yourself in fact a stronghold a place you can go back to and rest and stash your treasure and plan your next adventure or where you're going to go get hirelings to be able to do some of that dirty work for you so you don't have to do it like look at that uh evil looking cave system over there with a foul odor of death and um, disease coming out of it. Why don't you go ahead and go on in there and check it out and see what you find and come back and report to us and let us know. If there's any treasure, feel free to bring it out. So you have <laughs> that area you can go through as well. Now, the one thing I have not got into yet, because so far it's been above land out here in the Arctic as my guys have been moving around, but in the Game Master side of it, you also have a dungeon generator. So just going through the tables, we'll roll up a quick dungeon. So using my super dice here, this will be my tens and that'll be my singles. So I got 55. So looking at this, I'm gonna go, this dungeon was built during the blood mist. What is the size of the dungeon using one D6? A five, it's a large dungeon. There's four D6. Twenty-one rooms will be housed in this dungeon. 
the original purpose. Well, let's see what the original purpose was. 53. A prison. Oh, that ought to be fun. Who created the dungeon? Well, let's see. 22. Dwarves for greed. So perhaps they made this prison to lock away the other greedy races from stealing from them. And then what is the history of the dungeon? Well, we got a 31, so let's do a 31. As resources dwindled and builders left the dungeon, so they just left it abandoned. And other things soon came in and took it over. So what are the dungeon inhibitants? Well, let's figure that out. That goes into that as well, 42. Ghosts, oh, it's just getting better and better. What is the entrance to the building? Entrance to the dungeon, I'm sorry. 64. A stairway down into the deep. Okay. And it continues on from there to dungeon traps, dungeon oddities. And it even goes into a castle section to where you can build a castle as well. So, type of castle. Let's see what type of castle it is. 62. A fortress. It's large. Age of the castle. 43. During the Elder Wars. So that's, yeah, that's a pretty old castle. Original purpose. Display of power. So you can imagine it's going to be um, a very a very well made castle if it's a display of power it's gonna have all the bells and whistles for its time the founder of the castle 46 which is a cruel noble the condition of the castle so we're going to roll a d6 for that. It's going to be a 4. Warn. History of the castle. So let's see what the history is. 55. That's going to tell you. Conquered by enemies. The inhibitants. If ruined, modified to roll by negative 2. So we got a negative 2 roll here. So we're going to roll a d6. We got a 4. It's going to be a 2. No, but someone moved in later roll who has moved in table so who has moved in we go over here to this table and we're gonna go back to our d66 55 which is going to be elves have moved into this table how many and it goes into the amount and then it gives you a page number 54 you go back to that page and then boom it gives you all the information you need to know for those encounters. The abilities, it's going to give you skills, and there's going to be no talents associated with them. If you want to give them talents, you can. And then the gear that they're going to start with that are going to inhibit that castle. Now, Forbidden Lands in a nutshell. I really enjoy it uh, so far since I've gotten into it. Um, like I said, I've sat down and I I have to say, I think what really, really um, puts the icing on the cake, if you will, for this particular system is the fact that you get the little pamphlet that has that legend generator. You get the generators for the terrain, the encounters, the castle generator, the dungeon generator. Even if you play solo, the nice thing about it is it quickly builds this environment for you with a few dice rolls. And you don't have to go fumbling through a large library of stuff to be able to piece the stuff together and... Um, put that in you well you really wouldn't have to but you know what i'm getting at having uh source material to draw upon to do that now 
unlike a D20 system, you're not going to have hardness of materials and how hard this is to break and boom, 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 boom. This is strictly a skill heavy game. It's you roll and you either succeed or you fail. Same with your opponent in that world. But the cool thing I like about it is the fact that it is so story driven. And I have to admit, for a while, particularly with D&D, um, the old school D&D started out where it had the same premise and mindset on you don't want to do combat unless it's your last resort for the fact that it's dangerous and your characters could possibly die. So try to think your way out of the situation rather than fight and we move into now what we have fifth edition where everything is just hack and slash overpowered and you know kick the door in a mentality type of gaming which is cool because i enjoy that gaming that from time to time or cinematic combat like ruin quest to where it's so descriptive of the combat and but this is nice for the fact that it's all story. It's all 100% story and where you take that story from. Now, I have picked up and once I play through it, I'll do a review of that too and let you know my feelings on it. But as I was looking at this, because I recently came across this book right here, The Fantasy Trip, which is... A Steve Jackson game, if you're not familiar with Steve Jackson, he's the creator of the GURP system. And he recently, I don't know all the details about it, but somehow he reacquired the rights to his game system and decided to publish this and put this out. And very reminiscent of this system, Borderlands, to where it uses a very simplistic character building system, a minimal amount of attributes to play the game, and very skill heavy, if you will. This game does the same as well. But I decided before I just jump right into this and start this, maybe I should get Borderlands shot first. I think I'm going to be stuck on Borderlands for a while and. Who knows, maybe I'll do a few uh, playthroughs and upload them so you guys can see how it goes and see how that uh, does as well. Now, let's get into ranking Borderlands. Where would I put that? Uh, you know, and I'm gonna... I'm gonna rank it two different ways. So, the first way, if you were playing in a large group and you had a game master running this, and from a game master perspective, with just the amount of resources you have at your disposal to be able to create this world, and pit these, as we'll put it, challenges to your players, I would give it a 9 out of 10 if you were playing this in a large group. For RPG experience because it's something I think everybody's going to be able to have a really really great time with and it's a very unique system given the fact that it has such a rich story background to begin with to be able to build your characters and play in and it's just not your typical cookie cutout RPG. Now Let's get into the solo, because that's what I'm about. I'm all about the solo. I like solo gaming. I mean, you look around me. I'm going to say, besides my RPG books back here that I play solo, just about all my other games are solo. They're for the solo experience. Where would I rate this for the solo RPG player? I would have to rank this up there a 9 out of 10 as well. And the reason why I say that is the fact that it's a simple system to use. It's very story driven. The amount of resources that they give you, even if, if you're playing this solo and you're just doing the dice rolls out of the Game Master book and what have you as well, it's, you're going to get a story rich environment. And not only that, you can use those resources in your other games as well and pull upon those if 
you want to. And on top of that, like I said, the the system may look intimidating at first when you first open it up and get into it, but you're going to find out relatively quickly. It's a very, very simple read, and it's a very easy system to pick up quite quickly. As a matter of fact, by the time you get done moving through your first hex, you're kind of like, okay, I got this. I, I see where this is going and how this is uh, set up and meant to be ran. So with all that, my friends, that's my take on Forbidden Lands. I like it. I can't believe I spent this much time avoiding it. And I think back on that, and I think the reason why is maybe I was attaching the mindset of when this pandemic first hit and what was supposed to be two weeks and then back to normal life. And, well, that, of course, you know, as they say, the rest is history. So, with all that said, my friends, I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please click the like button. And if you haven't subscribed, if you're just uh, hanging out to watch the videos because you like RPG, uh, you're getting into RPG systems and you're looking for some tips and tricks, maybe how to do solo RPG or you play in a large group and you haven't been able to because of social distancing restrictions at that point and you're looking for maybe a different avenue to get your RPG fixed. Doesn't matter why you're here. You're all welcome on in. Just remember to click that subscribe button followed by the bell icon. Every time I upload a new video, you're going to get a notification so you don't miss one. All right, my friends, with that being said, this is Artichoke Dip signing off.